to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 50 of the Leo Training Podcast. And this week's guest is rowing coach Marlene Royal. Marlene and I discuss rowing technique, the human body in terms of posture, physiology, and how her education influenced her coaching style and principles that she adheres to when teaching the rowing stroke. Now let me tell you a little bit more about Marlene. As a competitor, Marlene has won major titles in sculling and sweep rowing, including a U.S. National Championship, a Collegiate National Championship, and a Head of the Charles title. She was awarded the Melissa Hale Spencer Award at the Westside Rowing Club of Buffalo in 1980 and the Beverly Jean Cook Award while on the Boston University rowing team in 1982. She also served as Boston University's Cruise Varsity Women's Captain in 1985. In 2000, she set two world records on the Concept 2 indoor rower. She is a registered occupational therapist in addition to being educated in physiology, massage therapy, and strength training. Marlene Royal's publications include Tip of the Blade, Notes on Rowing, Skillful Rowing, and Technical Drills for Sculling. Tech Tips is Marlene's column on the Crassberry Sculling Center's website, and her column training appears monthly in the international journal Rowing News. Marlene was among the first coaches in the United States dedicated to Masters Rowing. For 20 years, she coached at the Crassberry Sculling Center and was the center's associate director from 2004 to 2006. From 2005 to 2009, Marlene was the head coach at the Florida Rowing Center. Currently, she coaches at the Whistler Rowing Club, the Florida Rowing Center, and offers camps and lessons by arrangement. Marlene is married to Russian author Sasha Sokolov. Without further ado, we roll to episode 50 with Marlene Royal. Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. Thanks so much for coming on to the show. Good to be here, Joe. Yeah, I'm very excited to have you on. We've got an awesome episode. We are going to be talking in full depth and detail uh, regarding rowing and specifically the master's uh, demographic. So Great. before we get into the nuts and bolts of that, I would love for you to take a couple minutes. Please introduce yourself. Uh, let everyone know who you are, where you're you know, currently located. I'm incredibly jealous right now because <laughs> you're in some sunny warm weather so that's awesome but yeah go ahead tell us uh tell us who you are and where you're from and what you're doing great well at, at the moment at the moment um, i'm on the west coast of florida in the south south part of florida so it's nice and warm about 80 degrees um but the rest of the year i, I live out west in the mountains in uh, british columbia and um just to tell you a little bit of I think first about my educational background, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my rowing background because they they do both overlap quite a bit. And um, I grew up in Buffalo and um, went to high school in Buffalo and then went on to Boston University. And at Boston University, I studied at Sargent College of Allied Health Professions. And initially, I studied physical therapy. And then after two years in physical therapy, I actually changed my major to occupational therapy. Um, it was a little bit different orientation, um, kind of encompassed work, a lot of psychology as well as all the physiology and the neuro- neurology that you study um, when you study both PT and OT. Um, originally, my goal was to be a coach. And um, when I was looking at going to university at that time, you know, this is early 80s, there, there were not necessarily the type of programs out there that there are today. And, um, you know, I, I wanted something that was kind of the equivalent of the Institute of Physical Culture, of what that is in Eastern, Eastern Europe and Russia. Um, they have sports institutes where 
athletes go and learn to become professional coaches. So they study all dimensions of, of general sport and then they spe they specialize in their sport. And that was really what I wanted, something like that. But there, there wasn't that kind of program available at that time. So, and I didn't want to be a phys ed teacher because I wanted more, more uh, hardcore science um, with neurology, kinesiology. So, so um, that's why I decided to study PT and OT. And um, that did a lot to kind of give me the background that, that I wanted actually to take to coaching. And um, I did practice to some, some amount um, in OT. I specialized in hand therapy and upper extremity rehabilitation. So I did a lot of work in orthopedics and my second area of study was something called sensory integration, which is a lot of different type of therapies with the nervous system. Often they use it in schools with um, kids with learning disabilities to bring their, their, if their nervous system has not developed exactly the right way, it's, it's a whole mode of, of approach and type of therapy that, that develops the nervous system kind of from the foundation up to bring them back up to their say developmental level. So, so the neurology and, uh, I sort of consider myself kind of a bones and muscles person, you know, <laughs> so that's great. Um, so that, that was a very strong background, um, from a science point of view. And, um, and then I also went on when I worked in hand therapy, I also went on to, to get my uh, certi certification in body work and massage. And I studied in, I specialized in sports massage therapy too, as well. Um, so th those are kind of the things that sit behind my coaching, I would say from, from an educational point of view. Um, as far as rowing, I, st I started rowing in high school when I was 14. And at that time, it was 1977. And there weren't a lot of girls or women rowing at that time. It was very, very early. And uh, Westside Rowing Club started a girls program at that time. And, and Westside is a, is a very, very strong, established club. So I, I was in the first group of girls rowing out of Westside. And... Um, I would say, you know, it was a really great introduction to rowing because Westside has such a long, deep history and tradition and has produced a lot of great athletes and coaches, by the way. Uh, Tom Terhar, I believe, is from Westside originally. And um, so it was a really strong club background. From there, I went to Boston University and I rowed there for four years, um, was the captain my senior year. And we, we had a very good a uh, four-year period of winning some sprints medals and head of the Charles and national college titles. And I was very lucky to have two excellent coaches, uh, Stuart McDonald and Holly Hatton, who were both Olympic coxswains. So besides sort of the training and the racing and the college experience of rowing, uh, they were big influences on me because we kind of looked at rowing as a way of life. And it, we, we sort of used to joke and we used to define, well, there are rowers and then there's oarsmen. So the rowers are the people who show up for practice. They row the boat, then, then they go home. Um, the oarsmen are the people who are kind of living, living the life of rowing in the sport. So, you know, we, we were always kind of defining, you know, who was who on the team and stuff, but, but it was more of a philosophical approach. And, um, you know, they, they were a great influence because they also shared with us and with the team so much about their national team experience. And, uh, Holly was involved with, you know, the very, very first women. Um, she knew the 1976 boat. She was on the 1980, um, Olympic team that was boycotted, unfortunately, but she knew that whole era of early women's rowing too. So, um, so those were things that that was a really strong experience. Uh, after after college, I started sculling immediately after college, like the day after graduation. That's awesome. <laughs> and and, um, and then I and I was pursuing lightweight sculling uh, on the elite level for a couple of years, like in eighty five, eighty six, and eighty seven. Predominantly predominantly training in Boston, and. 
I also started coaching at that when I was in university at in um, Boston University because they had one of the first master's programs in the United States. It was a program called the BU Summer Rowing Program, but it was an adult recreational pro- program where you could come and learn to row sweep. And at that time, there was this was 1982. There really wasn't any opportunity for anyone to learn how to row in Boston. You know, community rowing was it was going to be another say four or five years before community rowing started. Clubs like Riverside and Cambridge didn't really have learn to row programs at that time. You needed to know how to row if you were going to join. So BU had this summer program, which was really big. Sometimes I had eight eights out on the water. Wow. Um, so it was a really, really big program. And, and that's, that's actually where I started coaching. And um, so my first coaching experience was with masters. And uh, when I started sculling, I realized that I really wanted to coach sculling. And I really liked working one-on-one with people and there weren't a lot of opportunities to do this because not that many people were sculling at that time either. Very few people had their own singles and there weren't even recreational boats at that time. Like, like there are so many things available now. And that kind of draw me up to Craftsbury Sculling Center in Vermont. So in, this is 1986, as soon as I graduated from university, I wanted to continue training full time. And Craftsbury was, a place at that time where, where uh, I could train full time and where I could start coaching sculling and coach a lot of masters. Though the program was very small at that time compared to compared to what it is now, but um, but essentially I spent about twenty years in in the program at Craftsbury, and um, I competed until eighty seven, and then I took a break for some years and um, did some traveling and I was coaching at this time. And, and I went back to training full time when, after the Atlanta Olympics and I was 33 years old. So I decided to make, to, to make another shot and try to go for it for four years. So when I was 33, I went back, back to full time training and, uh, and trained until I was, until I was 38. So I actually, kind of retired from from elite rowing when I was when I was 38 and uh, had some very very good successes making the Olympic team in 2000 was enormously difficult there were so <laughs> it just there was an incredible depth of lightweight scholars in the US at that time and um, so I like to think of myself as I was a very good two percenter <laughs> but uh, but it but it was a it was a great um, experience to take that five years at that age from 33 to 38 and to just dedicate yourself to training. And I think that it was that period of time where I really started to learn how to combine the training and coaching. And I had exposure to a lot of different coaches and I used to go for some winters. I used to go to Israel to train, and I went there um, when my husband is Russian and, and I speak Russian. And there were many Russian coaches in Israel after the Soviet Union dissolved. So there were some very good coaches to work with there. So for several winters, I went to Israel in the winter to work under some of these coaches. So I got a lot of exposure to their approach to training, and. Um, some of it's a little bit like Igor Grinko, yeah. <laughs> high volume, but not not all of it. it. It was a very, very total person approach. I mean, and they 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 were it, they were it was a very tough program, but there was always the moment when we're not going to push you over the edge to injury. We're always going to. They were always um, concerned about how are you doing psychologically, and, and you know they they coached the whole person. It wasn't you just come to practice, you go out in the boat, and then you go home. So that so that was a very important influence on my coaching and my training as an athlete as well. And I was happy to say that when I was 39 years old, I was much faster in the single than when I was in my early 20s. And um, but then I retired. I retired. Um, 
in 2001 from competition. And really since that time, I've, I've just been devoted to coaching and, um, my training program business actually grew out of that experience because it, it initially started as a fundraiser. That, oh, wow. Well, if you, if you contribute this to my training fund, then I'll, write your training program. I'll be your coach for the year kind of. So that was, that was how it began. And, uh, and then just little by little over some years, it grew into, into my full-time, full-time job. Um, nice. That's great. So after Craftsbury in 2000, 2006, I moved from, from the Craftsbury program down to Florida Rowing Center. And I was the head coach at Florida Rowing Center for, four years until 2009. And really now in the last seven years, I've pr- predominantly been um, freelance coaching. I would say I, I coach part-time in the Florida Rowing Center program. I do some select weekends and, and I do a lot of private camps at different clubs and visiting lo- different locations. That's, that's outstanding. That's awesome. It sounds, uh, it sounds like you get to, it's almost like, um, the, the endless summer instead of following the waves, you're, you're following the warm weather of rowing. Well, pretty well, you know, my, my philosophy was oh, like how to live on permanent vacation. <laughs> so, so, oh you know, God. you can, you can do it if you're, if you're creative and you're willing to, to give up a certain little bit of this or that, you know, to, to have the mobility yeah. to do it. And certainly when the internet became more popular around 2000, that that actually for a person like me who like to move around a lot and train in different places and go to different places it really opened it opened a lot of doors because i could i could be anywhere and be connected to my athletes and it didn't really matter where i was so that that was one of those things that kind of made it sustainable so that's awesome that's great that's great so not only a coach but an entrepreneur as well <laughs> very good um Okay, so you clearly had um, a multitude of, of very different influences, right? So you have the the, the PT and OT, um, uh, as well as the sports massage therapy, and then some of the coaching influences, especially with some of the uh, training trips you took over to Israel. Um, you know, get having the uh, the Russian influence there with the with the training. Um, and especially the consideration for the entire thing, you know, um, looking at the psychological, um, you know, neurological component, how the athletes managing fatigue as well as the, you know, the technical aspect and, and the training program. So that's, that's very, very cool. Very cool. Um, so some of the topics that we had down, so you, you cover why, you know, focusing and, and working with masters rowers, which happened very organically, it sounds like. Yes, it did. I mean, I, I didn't really expect it, but when I started working with adults, I really, I really liked working with adults. And I, I did coach high school for a couple of seasons at Middlesex School in Concord, Mass. And that, that was a lot of fun, but I was definitely more oriented uh, to adults. And I, I think i Adult rowing was very small at that time. I really had no idea masters rowing would come become such a such a huge huge field that it is now. Right. Um, it was just I just enjoyed being with the people and being able to discuss the hows and whys of things. And it was kind of always more of an exchange versus being in a motorboat, just kind of you know giving instructions. You know, it was it was more I it was more dynamic for me. No, that's great. That's awesome. Um, so that's, that's, a, a, a one of the topics we had down. So do you, based on your, your coaching experience, is there anything that kind of jumps out when you watch or, or see, um, you know, a junior, a high school athlete versus a master's athlete in terms of purely movement capability, like at that point in their life? Well, I, I think there's, to some degree, a lot of similarities these days, um, but for different reasons. So, uh, for example, the, the, the posture issues are huge, um, because of 
so much work on cell phones and iPads and, you know, all this forward head posture, a lot of sitting, you know, this definitely influences our, our young athletes. And I think one, well, at Craftsbury, when I was with that program, you know, in the summertime, there, there are a lot of high school rowers who come to Craftsbury. And, and I could see changes o- over the years. I could see changes in uh, decreasing flexibility, for example, um, postural issues, I would say. Um, you know, young people are when before they're they're really strong and they're growing, you know, they're usually very flexible and you know they have a lot of extra extra movement. So sort of keeping them snug right. is, is is difficult because because they're growing. But but I do think that that um, in the in the more recent years, you know, I've noticed that that young people have lost a lot of important flexibility. And, and so from this sense, they don't differ from the masters. The masters, masters, some of them lose flexibility because they just hate to work on their flexibility. Um, <laughs> some of them are very good about it. Like they get in there and they, you know, they take their yoga classes and, you know, they, they get on top of it because they know it's important to, to improve their rowing that way. Um, but, but, you know, there are the, you know, all the working online, working on the computers, driving. All these, all these things create a forward head posture, you know, which can lead to all kinds of nerve compression syndromes, things like uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. It can even cause carpal tunnel from a from an area if the compression is ha- coming, you know, high enough near near the neck or up in the upper shoulders. It can actually affect you in the hands. Um, so I think from the, that point of view, it's it's the same, but for different reasons and you know masters certainly there's there's so many different ages of masters people but um rowing with limited ranges of motion become more apparent with age unless people are really really good about taking care of themselves and you know you have to work around that with masters you have to work around that um you have to try to keep them in they're the strongest pattern, the strongest, most correct sequences that you can, given what they're capable of. So there, there are a number of things you can do with either boat setup, with rigging, to accommodate um, various lacks of flexibility. I think with the younger athletes, if they get in with the right program and they have they have good good coaches and good strength coaches working with them, you know, they can learn good mechanics right away. And if they learn the good mechanics right away, they'll probably keep them for the, for their rowing career. Um, I think if you, if you're not on top of that, you know, we face the same problems as we do with everybody. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, yeah, totally. uh, You nailed it with the forward head posture, rounded shoulders, just spending so much more time, these days sitting, you know, whether it's in school or on your phone or behind a computer. And then you, you're doubling up because this, this, the sport itself is in that, that seated position as well. So it's, it's kind of, we get the double whammy, so to speak, if we're a rower. Exactly. Plus driving. And yes, somebody's driving too, that, that if you're not actually, uh, set up properly in your car and, and, uh, I try to tell my athletes when you're in the car, you can be working on your rowing because you can work on your positioning. If you set, if you set your rear view mirror so that you actually, you actually have to sit back against the seat and have your head on the headrest. If you, if so that, so that your, your head is aligned over your hips. If you can set your rear view mirror that you're in that position, you know, then you avoid this forward head position, but many people, they're just not really aware of it. And, you know, as they hold the steering wheel, they tend to lean forward, but you should actually try to, you know, sit right over your hips and have those good mechanics when you're in the car. That helps a lot. That's great. I've never, I've never heard that before, but I love that because you're just keeping all the, the joints stacked over one another. Um, okay. So next, uh, next topic. So we, we touched on posture uh, as well. Um, do you want to go a little bit more into depth on like why that's so important 
in terms of making sure that you can maintain a good, strong position, especially as you're building fatigue in a, in a training session? Well, you know, I think as a, as a foundation of, of the rowing stroke, and this is certain, certainly something that, that I pay a lot of attention to coaching, um, as well as the, the other coaches who work at Florida Rowing Center, we, we pay an enormous amount of attention to posture and, it's the whole foundation to transmit our, the power of our stroke. And, you know, I've listened to a lot of Bob Kaler's work and he's, he's terrific about writing about this and that, you know, preventing the flexion, the flexion of the spine. You know, if, if I'm watching a rower and I'm, and I'm just seeing, you know, you're seeing the, 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 the back flex, you're seeing the lower back collapse. You know, I'm looking at all of this flexion as just, Basically, you know, that a lot of the power of your leg drive and the stroke is all being absorbed into the spine. And, you know, as Bob Kaler talks about it, you're sort of in a, in a survival position here where, you know, your muscles and, and your, your ligaments, everything is trying to just hold you together because you're, you're putting this force against your spine, which is not in the natural alignment of the curve of your spine. And when you're, when you maintain good posture and you maintain the, um, natural curvature of your spine in the stroke, and particularly, you know, when you, you hinge, for example, to set your body angle, it's so important that you hinge at your hip rather than trying to establish this angle by flexing through the spine. And that, this is a, a big issue in rowing because one, there's this image of rowing with the C back and the very curved back, you know, like the Eastern Europeans did back in the seventies. And, you know, I think a lot of rowing coaches have moved away from this model uh, because they start to see, you know, they see a lot of injuries. There's a lot of uh, back injuries are caused by an unstable position about, you know, shear forces going into the spine. And when you row with, with, you know, a, a good cylinder, so to speak, and, mm -hmm. and um, maintaining your ideal spine position, your spine isn't absorbing the force of the drive, but it's able to transmit the force through your hips into your body weight, into the swing to, to move the oar handle. And, and, you know, there's no reason why people have to have back injuries, <laughs> in my opinion, yeah. you know, and, and I've seen a number of masters who almost had to stop rowing because of back issues. And as soon as we work on their posture, as soon as they learn proper hinging to at the hip to set their body angle, they learn how to, to keep their lats engaged. They, they learn how to, you know, I emphasize a lot, for example, on the recovery, not to allow the, the shoulder blades or not to allow the scapula or the shoulder blades to slide forward. Because as you're moving into, into the position of putting the oar in the water, you know, if the spine loses its integrity, that's where, you know, the rower is going to try to, quote, get more length by, by stretching and overreaching through the upper body. So mm -hmm. if you're watching them, all of a sudden you're going to see the shoulder blade slides forward, slides forward. Eventually their weight kind of starts dropping down on their feet. They haven't put the blade in the water. But then when they actually put the blade in the water, you know, they have to come back into a position of stability before they connect to it. So all of this so-called reach is basically wasted energy. It isn't making you longer. It isn't, it isn't doing anything because your, your shoulder blade and your lats have to come into play in order for you to connect your weight to the oar handle. So I like to, to bring their focus to once they hinge, they set their body angle to keep their shoulder blades really stable and keep, keep their lats engaged, keep the work lower, like under, say under the armpits versus letting the work creep up in, in their traps. But your stroke length comes from your lower body. It comes from the position of your hips and where your hips are relative to the pin when you put the blade in the water, where the, the, amount of stretching or overreaching through the body doesn't determine that effective length. 
right. of the stroke. Mm-hmm. That's that's determined more by our hips using as much range of motion as we can getting into compression. So so all of that stems from posture, you know, on the recovery, maintaining maintaining posture is also, in, in my opinion, and, and what I practice when I'm coaching, it's also a matter of making sure that you're keeping your body weight of the um, the wrist and the forearm and the elbows. That when you when you press down and you release the blade and you start to move hands and body away and get your body angle, you have to make sure that you're keeping the elbow, the forearm, the hands, all that that weight has to stay above the plane of the or handle. The or handle, if, if you think of your, the level of your or handle like a great big tabletop, you have to keep that weight above the tabletop. If you keep weight into the system, so to speak, over the or handles, into the riggers, that you have to have a, what I use as a reference point here when I'm coaching is you have to keep enough over pressure over the top of the handle that it raises your sternum. If if you drop, if you drop, if your wrist drop below the handle, your elbows drop below the handle, all your weight goes into the seat, and that's usually where people's lower back collapses. So once they've felt this this ideal spine position, and as they hinge and move hands and body away, it's important to keep keep that plateau, keep that weight above the handles, which supports supports your sternum and supports the curve of your back. But it also keeps you light in the seat. Mm-hmm. So that's much better for the buoyancy of our boat. And as we move into the recovery of keeping the boat running better, that, you know, we have to stay light in the seat. We don't want our, if our weight all of a sudden comes collapsing down on the seat, which is usually what happens when the lower back collapses, usually the suspension is lost and the weight comes down on the seat as well. So that part of the stroke, you know, posture is absolutely key to you know maintaining a lot more momentum around the release and it, into the follow through of the stroke which is where the boat is traveling its fastest so without posture all that weight's going to collapse and basically push the boat down in the water so it's a it's a very very important element of how you uh, use your body weight awareness mm-hmm. of your body weight, stability of your body weight, and and also using the system of, of the riggers and the oar handles as a means of support to maintain that as you get closer and closer to the entry, you know, you need the support of the oar handles and kind of weight, weight into the pins, especially when you're out at, at full extension, you know, by keeping some weight over the oar handles and the lats engaged, you also maintain some weight against the pins, which is going to help you maintain that posture, you know, when you're out at your, your fullest extension. No, yeah, that's great. I, I really, um, I love so many of the points that you touched on. Um, I, but one of the things that I really um, resonated with me is you talk a lot about like using the lats so much of the, way that you're talking about getting stability is from the center out using the biggest, strongest muscles of the body to do so. Um, and I think that's so important because a lot of times we try to do it with what's on the, you know, the, the periphery or the distal ends of the body, the hands and the feet, and you have to learn how to do it, you know, from the, from the center out, it take it, it's very skill based. Um, but you know, just sitting here thinking about kind of pressing out a little bit, just very gently laterally, I can feel the, the lats contracting and I can also feel the, the chest and the sternum raising, just like you talked about. So well, the, the, la- the lats are very, are very key, especially, especially on the recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, on the, on the recovery, we have to think a lot about stability and sort of not just stability of our body, but stability of the whole system because our oars are out of the water. We want to keep a stable hull if we want the boat to move at the best speed possible. So actually when I'm coaching, I spend a lot of time on the recovery because the recovery has to be perfect in order to set you up for the perfect entry 
and, and, a, and a very good drive. Because in your stroke, basically, your oars are out of the water two-thirds of the time. So what you do in the boat during that time is very important to your boat speed. Um, if you had two crews who had equal drive, equal erg scores, equal drive pressure, but one one crew can row with their blades off the water, keeping their riggers absolutely level, staying with the speed of the boat, maintaining a higher base speed, more momentum on the recovery, and another crew rushes the slide, you know, the boat's going from side to side, they're killing the boat speed, you know, basically he who has the best recovery wins. And and recovery stability is is based on our core posture. It's based on maintaining a constant relationship to your pins. And some, a lot of people don't even think about pins of their <laughs> oarlock when they're in the boat. But, but in, in my world, the pin is your boat. That's, that's your focus of where you keep your weight all the time. And in a situation on the recovery, you know, how you, how you maintain equal pressure or an equal relationship stabilizes the boat because, because you're making your by your boat wide. So if you think of stability as orlock to orlock and keeping the orlocks level, that's, that's a very different platform than balancing. Like I would say the idea of balancing the boat is our distal balancing. That's people try to do it by pushing on their feet and moving their hands. And um, that's a very narrow plane. But if we bring this into our center and we, we work from the center out, then, then we can create a, a wide base of support. And one of the images that I like is, is, is I, I call it the diamond frame. So if I'm doing a video review and, and I'm looking at a sculler from the stern, you, you can essentially see how they are fitting into the structure of their boat. And if they're connected to their boat and you draw a line, you can draw a line, say, from the, the center, from their head, you can just draw a center line right down the center of their torso. You can draw a line from, if you draw a line from their shoulders to the oarlock, shoulder to the oarlock, their elbow should fit into that line. Your, their elbow should, where your body weight goes, where your elbows go. So at the release, you would see, you would see basically your line from the shoulder to the oarlock creates the top part of the diamond, and then your rigor to the oarlock creates the bottom part of the diamond. And so when you're looking at someone, you want, you want to see a, a symmetrical frame or symmetrical structure and in that case, if this person is symmetrical and, and I can see the diamond frame when I'm looking at them from the stern and we, we can see them keeping the weight of their elbows and forearms stable, you know, then they're, they're, they're connected to their boat. They're part of the structure. So now it's a system of your, your body, your boat and your blades, you're moving together. You're not in the boat doing something to the boat. And that's a very, very big difference in terms of how you're going to um, ultimately make your boat go fast. You know, that, that this, this puts you more in the mode of, um, I like to say, put everything in the context of a push and keep everything out of the context of a pull. You know, every time we think pull, that puts us into the C-shaped back, that puts us into, you know, shoulder blades slipping forward. That's, it's kind of a, a, disconnected chain you know you're sort of you're sort of pulling the spine apart in that model but if everything is kind of the strength of a, a cylinder or a press that actually is going to draw you into the center and hold you together no absolutely yeah 100 i 100 percent agree it's it's absolutely a push absolutely a push and it's so funny because we you know, we, we hear in, uh, uh, the verbiage is always, you know, pull harder, but, you know, we don't probably give enough thought as we should to the communication, but that's, that's pretty incorrect. It's not, yes. it's, it's not a pulling sport at all. It's when done correctly, it's very much a pushing sport. Right. It's like, it's, it's, I sort of think of it. It's like 
push push swing release. That's it's almost how I, I think yep. of the drive. Yeah. And and you know, and that's where we come into again, you know, coaching term terminology, the language you use. Um athletes are very good at doing exactly what you tell them to do. <laughs> and if you tell them to pull, they will pull. Right. You know, because they hear that word and, and they will do it. And I and I think, you know, another word that that's very misleading is the word hang because again think of if we hang there goes there goes all that um stability of the shoulder girdle right there as soon as you hang everything's everything's go uh, the scapular going to slide the athlete's probably going to overreach and um you know that's one of those words that it's a traditional word and a lot of people use it but but i i I try not to use that word. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, one of the things that, that really changed for me is, you know, after doing more and more work with, with strength training, like I, I think of it more now as a packed shoulder, you know? Absolutely. Yes. So, so yes. when you're doing, you know, a Turkish get up or a kettlebell arm bar, everything you talked about earlier with getting the, um, you know, the, the, the scapula depressed and the lat engaged, that's going to get the shoulder in the position it needs to be. It just takes care of itself. And learning how to do a lot of those uh, lifts on land very well translates to the stuff that you're doing in the boat. And it's it's very much, it's almost like you're sucking your shoulder into the socket rather than no, absolutely yeah right? you're stable you're, yeah right you're stabilizing or getting some what they call co-contraction when the muscles are working on both sides of the yeah. shoulder yeah. because in, inherently the shoulder is a very unstable joint that's, <laughs> yeah. it, that's why yes. it has so much mobility yep. it's sort of a very very shallow saucer with a great big you know dish in it so it has a lot of mobility but but the the kettlebell principles um, absolutely translate to rowing. I think it's one of the one of the best types of exercises that that people can do. They just they need proper instruction for it, but the principles are are the same. Yeah. And uh, you know, and kettlebells come from Russia, as you know. They're That's called right. Gyudia. They're called Gyudia in Russia. Yeah, Gyudia. So, and yeah, and they've used them for for hundreds of years. That's right. Hundreds, hundreds of years. So um, that's part of training for all athletes um, that were in the Soviet system and Russian systems. That that's one of the main foundations as well as running. So um they're fantastic. So all that, you know, all that type of work it just completely supports what we want in the stroke. You know, I, I think I think one of the things that's that's very different or very difficult about coaching rowing and difficult for people learning how to row is that they're not oriented correctly to what is happening in the dynamic of the system of the boat and the oars. Mm -hmm. And I call this thinking in the direction of the boat. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you can get an athlete oriented to what direction they're really going, and it, and it, and it sounds a little bit funny, but our body always wants to go the direction where we're looking, where our mm -hmm. eyes are. Our eyes are looking in the wrong direction and rowing because we want all of our force to help move the boat forward, but we're not, you know, we're backwards. So we don't see where we're going and, and where this comes into play particularly is in the second half of the, of the recovery, say when, when you start, once you've set your body angle and, and your arms, you know, once your seat starts to move and you, you start to compress this, this is a point of the stroke where many athletes get lost because what happens, what happens at this point, you know, when, when you're, when you're at the release and, and your arms are coming away, you're setting your body angle, you can see the pins, you can see your blades, they're in front of you, they're, they're within your field of vision. But as soon as you start to move up the slide and, and your hips start to approach the pin, you know, the, the blade is behind you. The pin is behind you. The pin has to be the, the focus to support your to support your body weight, but that's now behind you, and and that's a place where, it, especially for scholars, it's very easy for them to fall through their handles, and that's when you know they overreach. Their body weight goes forward. They literally 
if you think about what's happening at the oar handle, it's almost pulling their oars away from the direction of the boat. Right. It's opposite. Right. Verse, and, and so what happens, their weight falls on their feet. They haven't put the blade in the water. And so, you know, that, that creates a whole um, bunch of issues for us to, to make a good entry of the blade. But if, if you can get them just, you know, some people, I just say, okay, this is just, just day one when I've worked with some, I just want you to pay attention to where your pins are. They're like, I've never thought about this in my life. Well, just pay attention to where your <laughs> pins are. And, and as soon as you have that as a reference, that's a ge geographical reference point that you can use all the time in the stroke. And this becomes very important to be connected to the whole system, to move, to move the boat with your mass. And as a whole, you have to be, you have to be connected to it. So you have to know where things are going. So on the recovery, you know, as soon as, as your knees start to rise and, and I'll, t I'll use a sculling example here, but that your handles will start your, you know, you come through the crossover, your hands start to separate. You have to be sure to maintain working into the pin. And so the handles have to stay on a semicircle because we're always working around in the old days, they used to say, work around the swivel, you know, pivot around the pin and in, in sweep. It's easy to imagine, but in sculling, we have to do it on both sides, but we have to do it without losing our posture. And we have to do it without losing connection to the speed of the boat. So the, the method that I use is to teach the athlete, you know, I, I want you, you essentially to keep your body weight very neutral not faster than the boat, not slower than the boat as you approach the entry, because the boat is slowing down. If your body weight starts moving faster than the boat, you're going to disrupt this really sensitive timing at, at the top of the slide. But if you teach someone to take the, the um, motion of the slide, take it out of the lower body, meaning don't pull yourself up the slide, um, because you have no idea what the speed of the boat is, no matter how good you think you are, you don't know what the <laughs> speed of the boat is. And eight people certainly don't know the speed of the boat. Um, but you teach them to kind of focus on, just focus on separating the handles. Maintain your posture. Don't change the posture. Just separate the handles. It's just a widening of the handles. That keeps their weight working against the pin. And essentially... You can also help the boat move forward a little bit because, again, now you're working in the dynamic of the direction that it, the boat is going. So I like to think right. about it as, you know, you, you maintain your posture and basically you separate your handles to draw yourself up to the slide and, and, or you push the pins past your hips. And you don't have to change any posture in order to do that successfully and in order to stay exactly in time with the speed of the boat. And this is going to set you up to make a, a very good entry because there's no more um, syndrome of rushing the slide. Rushing the slide doesn't, does, can't exist in this environment. Right, right, absolutely. That makes total sense. I'm visualizing uh, that whole thing. That's awesome. And so, you know, this is, this is what happens on the recovery. On the drive, again, go back to thinking in the direction of the boat, it also becomes important, in, you know, in the first half of the drive, you're, you have weight against the oar locks because the, the blade is behind your field of vision. But as soon as you get midway, as soon as you're perpendicular, you know, so you're swinging through the drive, as soon as your oars are perpendicular, now your blade is swinging in front of the pin so I like to think this is when now the, you know, the, the, oar isn't keeping the pressure to the pin for us. We have to do it. So at this point on the drive, you know, when you're starting to swing, swing through the perpendicular coming into the second half of the drive, this is where it's, it's very difficult for the athlete to hold their suspension, you know, but if you're a really good rower, you can, you can keep your weight suspended in all through the second half of the drive, but you have to work your weight into the pin and you have to maintain that posture and the connection with the foot stretchers in order to, to hold that suspension all the way through the end of the drive. And, um, I try to even have them try to hold that through the release. 
Wow. And and that That's keeps great. that keeps you really light. You know, that keeps you light on the seat. And this is how you're going to um, improve your momentum because the boat moves faster after the blade releases. You're you're not going your fastest when the blade's still in the water. Right. The boat the right. boat speeds up to its highest speed you know, during your follow through. So the, the lighter we can be, you know, call your seat a digital scale if you want, <laughs> but, you know, but the, but the lighter you can be, the more you're going to, you know, keep that connection, hold that suspension. This all goes back again to our posture and, and maintaining that spine position. Otherwise that, that transmission of force is lost. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want to prevent as much, um, or many, as many energy leaks as possible. You, you Absolutely. Wanna, yeah. Right. That's great. That's awesome. That's great. Um, okay. So do you have any key differences between say the boat and the ergometer? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> well, they're two different worlds. Um, oh, absolutely. They're you know, totally two, different. Two, two, totally. two different worlds. And, you know, I think, I think the, um, the ergometer, it's, it's a great training tool. And, you know, if you're, if you're smart with it, you can, there's certain, certain technical things that, that you can really improve on, on the erg things like what we're talking about, posture, connection, um, suspension on the drive, you can work on, on the erg, but all these things we talk about on the recovery in this, this upper body stability and the importance of our weight into the riggers and weight over, you know, our weight over the oar handles is a big support and our riggers, um, in the boat absorb and assume some of our weight. They, they help us, you know, riggers help distribute our weight throughout the hull. So, so, you know, even putting 10 or 15 pounds of weight over the handles into the riggers helps the boat run better. This, this you can't practice on the erg. That's what's difficult because we have a free handle. We, we don't have any wide base of support. We don't have riggers or oar locks. So, and we don't have handles to separate to push the boat past us, right. which, which is an, a very important dynamic in, 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 uh, in the boat in rowing. And in rowing, you know, we're working in a, in a circular environment, you know, our, our handles yeah. are always staying, are tracking on a semicircle pattern. And in the erg, we're in a linear environment. Yep. And, and we're only in one plane of motion versus three. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think the important thing is, I mean, for conditioning, for testing, for objective measurements, um, it's great. I think it's just really important that the rower understand the differences that of what they're doing on the erg and what they do in the boat. And, um, you know, rowing in a way that you would never row in the boat can get you better erg scores. That's, yep. that's a fact because, because the erg is all, you know, is all the length of your stroke, you know, it's, it's forced force times distance. So, if you row a really, really long stroke, I mean, you can be falling off the back of your seat and the erg's not going to penalize you for that because it doesn't give you a score about your recovery. It, it scores you only on the drive and, and it doesn't care what you do on the recovery. It doesn't even pay attention to that. The boat is a different story because it's, it's um, as I said, it's, as important, if not to some degree more important in the boat, because our oars are out of the water for two thirds of the stroke cycle. So if you're in a race, you know, your oars are out of the water two thirds of the time. So that's a, you know, a 600 stroke race of the head of the Charles, your oars are out of the water, the equivalent of 400 strokes. So, so that, you know, that's the difference in the skill that, that has to be trained. But, but I think if you're interested in moving the boat, well, you can certainly use an erg effectively. I know for like low intensity rowing, I like people to row with their feet not strapped in because that that's one way that it it limits their their backswing so so that they don't have this really exaggerated backswing when they're on the erg. Um, just have them take their feet out of the shoes, and they certainly can work on sequencing and posture. And kind of all these things that are happening in the center of the boat, you know, you can work on those. Even even keeping your wrists and forearms and elbows level, you can work on the 
on the erg on the or handle um, if you're aware of it. So you know you can you can still make a pretty big contribution to your rowing. I think you just have to be really aware of you know what it is and what it's not. No, absolutely. And the the, the key word there is being aware. Aware. Yes. Aware. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's and great. and in this case, your eyes do look at the monitor all the time, <laughs> which is not the direction you're going in the boat. So right, <laughs> right. That's a great point. Great point. Um, okay, so I have some I gathered some some uh, questions from masters rowers. Um, okay, so can masters in the the racing E category or E plus handle workouts twice a day. Some can. Okay. I think it depends. It, well, there's again, individual, individual factors, but, um, you know, I do definitely have athletes who are in that, that age category and some of them do t- train twice a day. Um, they may, for example, like on days where they do their strength training, they may also have an aerobic component that they did that day. It might be a cross training day. It might be a low intensity day. Um, sometimes there are people who prefer to have their intervals in the morning and they do their strength training in the afternoon. They kind of load up the day. Um, it's a hard day, but then they make the next day really an active recovery day you know, versus and that. And for some people that works better than, um, you, you had a hard training day and then you had a strength day and then you had a light day and then, you know, instead of distributing, you know, distributing it out. So, um, I think depending how long your sessions are too, you know, there are definitely people who can do, um, a rowing session and a cross training session in the same day. If you're prepared for it and, and, and if, and, and depending how you balance, um, your intensities, you know, I think the important thing in with everything is that you have to build in rest, whether it's a rest day, whether it's a a half a day, um, whether it's 30, 36 hours, uh, that, that becomes our bigger factor is, um, how you recover. And, and, you know, after 50, it's going to be different. So, and, you know, and sometimes you're not sure, you know, strength, certain types of strength workout can be more demanding for the nervous system to recover from, um, than some other types of things, you know, things, kettlebells have a very special effect on the nervous system. They, they seem like, Oh, I didn't do that much, but then the impact is quite strong. I, I I find anyway, in my my own experience, it's because it's sort of, it, it stimulates your nervous system in a very broad way. It's different than if you went and did, you know, some machines and some bench pressers, things like that, because it's so much more integrative. Um, but yes, I think you, you can do workouts twice a day, as long as you balance the intensity and you make sure that you build in rest. And now you may not do that right away. If you're, if you're only doing five sessions a week, and you want to build up to say maybe three days, you want to do, do two sessions, you know, for one month, just maybe add in one or one day or two days and just, you know, let yourself get used to it. Don't all of a sudden do double sessions three days a week and out of the blue (laughs) because you're probably going to be really tired. But, but, um, you know, if you're prepared for it and you work up to things gradually, you know, there's no reason why not. Some, some people, you know, really, really like that. They like doing something in the morning, something in the afternoon. You can also do slightly shorter sessions if you're doing more frequency. Awesome. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, so what is some advice you have to accommodate training, uh, when you, when either equipment is not available or you are in a time crunch? On, do you think on land? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe okay. so. If they were had to substitute something in on land. Well, I'm a firm believer in running, <laughs> though a lot of rowers aren't fond of of running. But um, if you are able to run and you don't have any, you know, restrictions that you can, or injuries that you can't run, you know, running is always one of the most 
economical ways to get a great aerobic workout. And you mm-hmm. don't need any equipment if, if you have just a space, a space where you can run. Um, body weight, body weight exercises, you know, even things like, like air squats or, you know, or, um, push ups, do, you know, push up, push ups, pull ups, um, elastic bands. You yes. know, I know when, when, uh, some years, like when we, when we've traveled a lot, you know, we carry elastic bands with us all the time. You can even do that in a compartment in a train if you want to. Right. Um, but things like, like squats, um, deep squats that, that you can get plenty tired just from doing body weight squats this way. Um, you know, your types of core work. I mean, those are, those are things you can do. No, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I was just going to add in, I think, you know, I, I really learned this past year how taxing body weight training can be. Um, so like earlier this year, one of the things that I was pursuing and I earned in, in August was the SFB, so the Strong First Body Weight Certification. So women have to do a one-arm push-up. Men, uh-huh. ha- men have to do a one-arm, one-leg push-up. So, and that's only one of the six skills taught at the certification to go over tactical pull-up. So doing it from a hollow position, just like gymnastics. Uh-huh. Handstand push-ups, pistol squats, a single leg body weight squat, um, hanging. That's leg. one of my favorites. Yeah, single leg squats is definitely one right. of my favorites. And that and that's so you can do that at home. You can do that anywhere, and you know they're killer. They are, and they are, and <laughs> and so some of the things that I love a lot about a lot of those movements is that it is um, it's low rep. You don't need to do a lot of repetitions if you're doing them right, right. and it's a very honest and good appraisal of your balance and symmetry on the left to right side. So, you know, you know, there's no hiding. You got some things to work on. If you can, you know, go, you know, all the way down and do a full pistol on the right and you can't do it on the left. Exactly. Exactly. And that, you know, that's great. And that, you know, and also, you know, the one legged squats or even just doing, just doing squats with no weight or just holding this counterbalancing with the small Mm -hmm. weight. I mean, that all works into your hip flexibility that directly relates to our positioning, you know, moving into, into the entry at the, at the top of the slide. So, so it might be a blessing for you not to have any equipment available. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Totally. Um, do you have any, uh, recommendations in terms of say an athlete is crossing multiple time zones and traveling for, you know, a race, um, you know, how to, how to manage their, their energy expenditure or how to, uh, account for that? Like, you know, should they be leaving several days beforehand to acclimate to the, to the difference in time, that type of thing? Ideally, yes. Um, one, one day per hour of time zone difference. That's okay. the ideal. Yep. Yep. And now world masters games is in New Zealand in April. So there are going to be a lot of masters going to that. And I believe the time difference is 13 hours, 12, 12 or 13. That's a big time zone. And, you know, probably a lot of busy masters aren't going to have 13 days to acclimate Right. Going over there. Yeah, you know, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, that's a two, two weeks before your race. But there is a way, it's a little bit unorthodox, but there is a way that, that you can start to prepare yourself. And that is, you know, determine, determine the, the times of your most important races and, and just see approximately what time of day they're going to be held. Are they going to be late afternoon New Zealand time? Are they going to be in the morning New Zealand time? And, um, and then figure out what your time is at home mm-hmm. and, and what you can, what you, there, there's a, a website, I think it's called time buddy. You can, you can put in two cities and you can, you can convert the time, but what you can start doing and what I would recommend start doing is, you know, it could be a really strange time of day for you, but start transitioning to New Zealand time before right. you actually go to New Zealand and start doing some um, you know, if you get there and you only have two or three days, you're not going to have a lot of, you know, you're, you're on the opposite of the day, you know, their, their day is your night. And, and so what you can do is start doing some of your workouts and practices 
on New Zealand time. No, you start, that, that's get your body get your body used to used to that time. Um, that was something that uh, C. B. Sands and Chris Ernst did. They mm-hmm. won the the lightweight double in 1986 in Nottingham for the U.S. and and they didn't have much time before the regatta in, in Boston. And you know they were actually out you know, rowing in the middle of the night, you know, rowing at wee hours of the morning. And because they were, they were already starting, you know, a couple of weeks before the world championship to, to live on regatta time. And, um, and, you know, I think that made a a very good difference to, you know, avoid that acclimat, acclimatization. You know, I know with altitude, if you usually start to, well, even if you go from altitude down to sea level, I think you begin to get the effects of acclimatization on the third day. So to some degree, you might be better off just to fly there and right, race right away than to fly there and be there for three or four days and then race. You know, it depends how how sensitive you are to things like that. Some sure. people doesn't bother them, but other people, it can really, really make them feel um kind of disoriented. So, um, so those are a couple ways to approach it and just good nutrition, staying really, really, um, you know, staying really well hydrated. And when you get to your new location, and this, this is for people who business travel a lot too, you know, one of their main rules, if they're training and they also, you know, they fly to China every week and, and then to London and things like that. One thing they try to do is as soon as they arrive at their destination, get on local time. No matter how tired you are, no matter what, just immediately start living on local time. And, and that helps, you know, you might have one day that's really uncomfortable, but, but then, but you'll adjust faster. No, that's great. That's great. Uh, that was awesome. You, you jogged my memory. I remember um, one of the last few years that they had the event, the men's Cox four, I remember one of those years the U S won. it might've been the last year, but I, I remember specifically it was a major time zone difference. And I remember reading a press article and those guys got up very early in the morning, like three or four in the morning and did mm-hmm. all their training to replicate the, the race time for that. So that, that, uh, that, that jogged the memory bank, so to speak. <laughs> So, I mean, actually, from, from the U.S. to New Zealand, as I said, I think it's 12 or 13 hours. So that, that actually might not be too hard to coordinate at home versus, say, something like five hours when you're used to, right. you know, it, I mean, it's one thing to row at midnight, then five o'clock in the morning, or, or you may row at five in the morning instead of five at night or something like that. But, um, but that's, I would try that. Very that's a cool. Long, that's a long flight too. <laughs> yeah, oh. but it's gonna it's gonna be a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal event. So many, many U.S. people are planning to go to World Masters Games, and uh, it has many, many different sports. But rowing is one of it, and it's held every every four years in different locations. So it's it's quite good competition. That's that's awesome. It sounds like a really fun regatta and experience for sure. Um, so before we move into the rapid fire, I want to make sure that we, we touch on, um, Faster's Masters, uh, one of your, mm-hmm. your most recent projects as well as, uh, your, your book. Um, so could you tell the audience a little bit about both? Sure. Uh, Faster Masters is, uh, a project that I did together with, uh, Rebecca Caro of Row Perfect and Row Perfect um, is, is an educational website and, and, uh, they do all kinds of great interviews, rowing chats with, with different coaches and athletes, and they produce a lot of products all geared towards educating rowers, coaches, um, on all aspects of the sport. It's really an incredible, incredible business. And we got together and developed a series called Faster Masters. We actually have it set up as kind of a membership, like you join Faster Masters, and the 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 gold membership in, includes in it uh, seven recorded episodes that we did. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca, and I are talking with each other. She's kind of she's inter interviewing me, and um, each one is about fifty minutes recorded. And we talked. We did a review of technique. Um, 
adapting technique, it's all for masters, but adapting technique with limited range of motion. Um, we talked about, we have an episode on speed work, an episode on stroke power, on blade work, on um, specifics of 1K racing and uh, starts. And another um, final episode is about testing and trials protocols. And uh, so it's quite in depth and each, each recorded talk has a, a written transcript with it. And then for each, for each episode, I also prepared a little ebook of all of support materials that are things that I prepared or some of my articles about certain topics. And for the, for the race planning uh, segment, I, I included one of my favorite things, which is um, an interview that I did with Zeno Mueller and he actually described to me step by step everything he did before his Olympic race in Atlanta. And, and he actually described for me um, the entire race. And, and so I included that. That's kind of like some exclusive material there. But um, very cool. It, it's just it's just an awesome description of a very precise approach to a race and race plan. And um, and so there's also an intro package if people just want to try the first episode and see if, if they like that. And then they can always upgrade to the faster master's gold. And we're also going, we're now in the process of setting up, you know, kind of a faster master's community where people will be able to send questions to me and, you know, we'll have like question and answers and we'll have a, we'll have a, a group dedicated to that. I, I don't know if it will be a blog yet or we'll set it up as a Facebook group, but we're in the process of doing that so that people will be able to communicate. And um, we have more projects coming up in the future, but we're just getting this one off the ground right now. And uh, Very good. That's awesome. Congrats. There. And then the, I have two other books. One is Tip of the Blade. And that's a collection of different articles that I've written from like 1999 to 2007. I'm, I'm due to do it again, I think. <laughs> and uh, it's the type of book you can just open it up and read it anywhere. And, you know, you'll, it's, you'll open it up, you'll, you'll find the topic you needed to know for the day. And, um, and the first book I did was with Ed McNeely, who is the strength coach for Rowing Canada. And he's published a lot in rowing literature. And we, we did a book called Skillful Rowing, and he wrote the, the training portion of the book, and I wrote the technical portion of the book. Awesome. That's great. I'll have to, uh, I'm going to have to dig around and find that one now that to the, the library, so to speak. So very cool. Very cool. Um, all right. We're going to move into the rapid fire. This is like one of my favorite parts of every, uh, every guest's interview because um, we get the chance to, to get to know everybody a little bit better. Um, okay. So first question, Marlene, given your current knowledge level and all your life experiences, what advice would you give yourself uh, 20 years ago? 20 years ago was exactly when I went back to training for the 2000 <laughs> Olympic team. Um, it was exactly 20 years ago. And my advice to myself as I was driving to my nine to five job was do exactly what you want and just jump off the cliff and, and go for it. You'll, you'll figure it out. And uh, that, that was my advice. And, and I think it was the best thing I, I ever did was I, I walked into the office and, and quit my job <laughs> and gave my two weeks notice and went back to full-time training. I didn't even know what I was going to do for work or anything at that point, but it didn't matter, but everything worked out absolutely, absolutely fine. But, um, you have to trust your intuition. You have to do exactly what you want, because if you don't create space, you have to create space for something else to move into that space. And when you try to hang on things for the sake of, um, no, sometimes, you know, there's security aspects, but, you know, every time I've stepped off the cliff and taken a risk and I've, I've done it a lot of times, um, you get better at it the more you practice it. But, um, really if you're doing the right thing, everything always works out a hundred percent of the time, a hundred percent. So just, you know, if, if you have that inkling and there's something you really want to do, just, just go do it. That's awesome. I love that. 
That's good. Got to follow your heart. That's so, so important. Um, what's your favorite strength training exercise? Kettlebell swings. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love that. It made my night. Very cool. Um, how has your training changed today compared to 20 years ago? Well, I don't do as much volume, that's for sure. I mean, I'm, I don't compete. I don't compete anymore. I've actually never really competed at the master's level um, because I got so involved with, with coaching. So write, writing lots of training programs and helping other people compete, it's sort of my mind isn't on competition for myself. Um, but I'm, I'm more of a recreational athlete and I probably don't do as much, as much hard work as I used to do, Mm -hmm. um, or as much, or as much volume, but, but I do, you know, I, I do train every day and, and sometimes twice a day and, you know, I do row and cycle and, and do my gym work and stuff just because I like, I like the lifestyle of being athletic and, and training, you know, I don't really, I don't need the competitive goals anymore. Um, but I think it's really important to, to stay in good shape and to stay healthy and, and, uh, enjoy being outside. And so I'm more, um, calm about it these days. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. No, that's great. That's great. I love that. That's definitely, I've, I haven't been, you know, I did the head of the Charles in an alumni boat this, this fall, but it's mostly been more about, you know, being stronger and healthier and taking care of my body because realizing, you know, you only got one, you got to make it last. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and I like, and I like the process of training. So, yes. you know, for me, I, I'm not one of those people that, oh, I just wanted to, to do 20 minutes of something just because that that's the the minimum, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to cycle for a couple of hours. You know, I like, I like long distance training. So, you know, I'm happy to spend the time training just because I enjoy doing it. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Um, have you ever had an injury? And if so, how did that change your training? I've been pretty lucky that I haven't really had a major injury. Um, I've had a broken bone, but I, I wouldn't really, I won't consider that an injury in this case, because once it healed, it didn't really affect anything. Um, in, in college, I had a back injury that was a muscle strain that happened um, in my second year of college. And it kept me out for a good part of the competitive competitive season. And it took me probably a summer to kind of ease back, ease back into rowing. And, um, and cycling was actually a a big part of that because that was something that I could do for a long time, but that also kind of helped my back feel stretched out and better. Um, but but once at that time, I think it was just a very heavy training load and we weren't prepared for it. Um, but actually after that, I never really suffered an injury that, that was anything major. So, you know, I've been quite, quite lucky in this case, but I'm very, I'm very conservative. Um, you know, when in doubt, wait, you know, if something feels a little bit sore, I just back off right away. So, you know, I, I was never a person to really, to, to push through that type of pain. And I think probably coming from an orthopedics background, you know, I realized (laughs) if something's not happy, just stop, you know, just, just let it rest for a day or two. It's much better than losing a month or two. So, so I, I've actually been quite lucky in, in this sense. That's, that's so, so important. I'm glad you, you, you said that because, uh, that's not always the, the mindset that we tend to no. take. So it's good to be, um, you know, back off, you know, you can come, you can come to the gym tomorrow rather than having to take, you know, a month or however long off from training because you get hurt or get sick or exactly. You know, I mean, it's injury is a, is I consider it, it's a training mistake. An injury is a training mistake. And, you know, it's, it, even with, with the masters that I work with, you know, I mean, sometimes things happen and, and people do get injuries, but, but actually, you know, given the amount of people that I've worked with, I've been very, very lucky that not many people, 
have injuries. And, and I think, you know, we just, we just try to, to catch it right away. And if something flares up, we just back off, you know, and just wait, go do something else and just wait till it clears up and that you're not faced with that problem. Yeah, no, best to, you know, be, be exercise. Extra. Yeah. Exercise, exercise some prudence and just be patient. Yep. Um, okay. I'm going to flip the next one around because we're, we're, most of the conversation has been with masters. So what's one thing that masters athletes should be doing more of to complement their training and their health? Flexibility work. Okay. Okay. What's your best tip to improve recovery post training session? Sleep. Yeah. (laughs) All right. If you had to pick one, what's your favorite meal? Well, I, I've spent a lot of years in the Mediterranean, so, so I would be, I, I, I sort of consider myself like a peasant gourmet kind of a person. Um, I think I, I would be a good old, like Greek salad, lamb, tzatziki, nice red wine, oh. but definitely something Mediterranean. <laughs> that sounds delicious. Um, Okay. This can be any uh, subject matter or genre. What's one book that everyone should read? Thinner this year. Okay. Okay. Um, it's, an, it, it's an interesting book because it's written by rowers and it's a good lifestyle health book, but the one woman who wrote it, she is a PhD in muscle nutrition at Tufts. And she's also competes in the head of the Charles in her single. And the other co-author who does her program, uh, is 80. He he may be 81 years old this year. And he also races a single in the head of the Charles, but it's a fantastic lifestyle book, especially for masters. So very cool. I'm going to check that out as well. Um, Final question. Who do you study currently or have you studied in your career to improve? Tudor Bampa is one coach. I've done, I did a strength certification with Tudor Bampa. Um, I really like the work of Stuart McGill, who's a, a back researcher. He's, he's great. And um, his wife is actually one of my athletes. So, um, I get some inside tips every once in a while. And, uh, and I love, um, and of course, Pavel Tatsulin, you know, I love yeah. his stuff too. I think it's, it's just, it's great. And, um, Marlene, I can't believe that you and I took this <laughs> long to talk. I <laughs> well, it's, I found you through Will Ruth. Through the I Stanford know, Co- but like, table. you know, I got all three of Dr. McGill's books and, you know, I have a bunch of Pavel's books as well. So that's like, it's, I'm cracking up right now. It's fun. well, it's all it's all great foundation stuff, and uh, and I love Bob Kaler's work too. Um, I'm now reading a lot of his stuff, and you know, and again, all all of these things support good back mechanics, and that's that's the foundation to our good mechanics in the stroke, and and um, you know, we sort of getting out of that spinal flexion and the really curved back. And, you know, just because some Olympic rowers may still row that way doesn't mean that it's necessarily a safe way to row um, for your lifespan. You know, I mean, uh, people on the world championship level are much younger than some of the people we're talking about. And, um, you know, maybe they can hold up a little bit better if they're not in optimum uh, positions and they're, they're physically just incredible, incredible athletes. You know, they're not like you and I, you know what I mean? They're the, the half percenters. <laughs> so, no, you know, that, that's so, so they're incredible. I mean, they're incredible, yeah. incredible people, yeah. but when you're looking at a tech to- technical model, you know, you have to look at your own limitations, your own range of motion, your physical preparedness, and, you know, you have to row in a way that's, 
safe mechanically. And, and so, you know, I mean, I think, I think we probably agree a lot on injury prevention and, you know, going to any extreme possible to prevent an injury. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's important like to note that, you know, having that, that type of posture, there's always going to be outliers. So, there might be some athletes that can do that and be effective and, and get really good results. But, you know, going back to some of what Dr. McGill said in his book, like the, the safest, strongest posture, if you're doing strength training, like you're going to pick something up heavy is to have a neutral spine. And then the second safest posture is if you were looking at some of the the strong men, they, they pick up the Atlas stones. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm bending over, but they're also creating an incredible, um, you know, spinal brace throughout their mm -hmm. body. Um, so they're able to, you know, lift a very heavy load under what you would consider some, some sort of, uh, flex spine. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, you know, going back into what you were talking about, having that posture, making sure the joints are aligned and stacked properly and you're utilizing the, you know, the entire system and really taking yourself out of injury risk and using the, the spine to transmit greater energy into the boat. Sure. And I think, and I think like for masters, for example, you know, if there are people, many people don't have coaches available to them very mm -hmm. often but I, th I think if they go to a gym and they work with a trainer and they work with the trainer to learn a really proper deadlift motion. Yes. Those same, those same, that's because, because that's something they, they probably can get access to fairly easily. And most gyms is a trainer who could teach them a good deadlift. So, you know, learning those mechanics are identical to the mechanics in the boat. So when people, you know, that, that's something I think masters can do. If, you know, if I wanted to say for masters, two exercises, I would, I would say maybe, maybe kettlebell swings and, and, uh, deadlifts. Yep. If they could do one, I would say deadlifts just be from, because of the technical point, there's so much carryover in, into the stroke. And that's something that they can be coached on to, to have really good mechanics. And then that awareness will, will transfer into the boat. Well, you, you've, uh, you said it, but that's, that's awesome. Cause that's one of the things that I, I believe in wholly. Um, I I've seen, I've seen it firsthand. I've had athletes I've worked with say the same thing. Um, you know, and I, and I think the, the big, the big point is, is one is you're developing the awareness on land in a very safe, controlled environment. And that's, I think often lost is that when you're on, on the, on the water, there is a lot of variables that provide a lot of extra noise that completely disrupt, you know, the signal going to the athlete and, mm -hmm. you know, you're just on sensory overload. Yeah. There's a lot going on. I mean, I mean, it's, it, if you're rowing a single too, and you're rowing a single in a competition, I mean, you know, there's a lot of multitasking going on yeah. here. So, yeah. and, and it, you know, there is a lot of distractions and, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why experience becomes so important in racing a single successfully because, because little by little you, you have to, you have to manage all this other stuff going on, on race day, not just your, your technique in the boat, <laughs> you know, there's everything else, steering and noise and obstacles and weather and no, totally. It, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. There's, there's a million things going on just beyond, uh, putting the oars in the water and pushing hard. Um, but Marlene, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Great. Well, I've enjoyed it too. And I hope that our masters will like it too. Oh, I know they will for sure. So just, just hang on the line. Let me give you a proper goodbye and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, get off the air. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Leo Training Podcast. If you found the content valuable, please head on over to iTunes and drop in a five-star review. Or share it on your favorite social media network such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And be sure to tune in next week with another brand new episode when I interview Dr. Tim Szymanski, the WAD Doc. 
Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.